Well, good evening, folks. How goes it? I, I feel like we're sort of at the beach here tonight. <laughs> I hear it's a little warmer here than it was a week ago. I, I'm glad. That's a, a really good thing. Uh, yeah. So, th I, I, first of all, this is for uh, Brian and the staff and any other churches that are involved in this besides this one. Uh, the fact that you are doing this tonight and this week is so commendable and so encouraging. I'm just delighted to see that there are churches in the area that are commemorating Sanctity of Life Week and Sanctity of Life Sunday. I can't tell you, hear, hear. That is, that is such a good thing. I can't tell you how many semesters have gone by when I teach Christian ethics. And I ask my students when we get to this material on the beginning and ending edges of life, I ask for a show of hands, say, how many of your churches do anything around Sanctity of Life Sunday? And there are very few questions that I get more of a deer in the headlights look for than that one. And most of my students, they give me that look like, I didn't even know there was such a thing. Not to mention, and, and it's, it's very rare that uh, I have any of my students raise their hand to say, yes, my church does something regularly on this, these particular Sundays around the time to c commemorate Roe v. Wade being handed down 48 years ago. So I just, uh, my hat's off to all of you for, for coming to this, for being interested and engaged in this. I can't think of too many questions that are more basic and more foundational to where we are as a culture and where we're headed than, Brian, the way you put it. What does it mean to be human? Who counts as a member of the human community? I think if we don't get that one right, I'm not particularly optimistic about getting the other ones right that we're wrestling with as a culture. So what I'd like to do is, uh, is just, just give us a, a, you know, a foray into the, this whole area of the sacredness of human life in all of its various uh, manifestations. The term, technical term we use for this that you can go home and impress your neighbors with is you were delving into the area of bioethics tonight for a few minutes. And we're going to give you a whole host of things that have to do with that particular field as it touches on both the beginning edge of life and the ending edge of life. But b before I do that, I need to give you a bit of a, maybe a, bit of a, um, a heads up. Because I tell, my, I tell my philosophy students regularly at Talbot that if you want to pursue some of, the, some of these areas and with a little more interest and a little more enthusiasm and a little more time and effort, be prepared for these, some of these issues to follow you home. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, I, I found that God in his providential sense of humor has seen fit to, to have virtually every professional area that I have been seriously researching and writing and teaching on to follow me home. I first got interested in a lot of this material back in the late 1980s. And I, I won't, I, and, and I just so in case you're wondering, that was when I was at age 14. Uh, and those of you that aren't laughing, I think I appreciate that too. Uh, <laughs> Some of you need your eyes checked if you thought that was really funny. Uh, but I, got, I first got interested in this when I was a doctoral student. And it was about, a, it was about at that time when uh, in vitro fertilization was barely 10 years old. And these surrogate motherhood arrangements were the stuff of TV miniseries. That, that was the kind of stuff you couldn't make up what was going on in real life any better. And it was about that time that my wife and I started a roughly four to five year journey with infertility ourselves. And we recognized that those, looking back, those were the four to five toughest years of our married life. Uh, we were exasperated with God on numerous occasions for why, you know, why teenagers could look at each other crosswise and get pregnant and we couldn't. Uh, and then around... The, the, maybe the late, early 90s, early to mid 90s was when the first assisted suicide bill was, was in the legislature and on the ballots in the state of California. And as you know, they, they failed repeatedly until 2014, 15, 
Uh, but about that time, about the early 90s, was when it first started gaining momentum. And I, was, I did a lot of speaking and debating uh, in medical centers and churches and hospitals. The interesting thing was, it was about that time that uh, that one followed me home too. That my wife and I began journeys with three of our parents successively through terminal illnesses. And walking with them and making decisions about stopping end of life treatments. And watching them go into hospice. Uh, which if you've not had that experience with a loved one, our experience was that hospice nurses and physicians are the closest thing this side of eternity to guardian angels. And then about the year 2000, uh, that you may be familiar with what's called the Human Genome Project, was first published, quote, published, uh, and the, the, the human genetic code was mapped in its entirety for the first time. And, and soon after that, there were several diagnostic tests that became available for certain genetic conditions that we had identified the markers for. And one of the first ones of those was the, the genetic glitches that gave a woman a, a, an 80 to 85% likelihood of developing breast cancer in her lifetime. And my wife had come from a family where her oncologist told her that her family was the largest extended family he had ever treated which was not something we, that was not a distinction we were actually hoping for. Almost every woman in my wife's extended family has either had breast cancer or died of it. And so I suggested, when, she, when the test for these genetic markers came around, I suggested that she just forego the test and assume she was testing positive for it, since the chances were pretty high. Turned out, in retrospect, that wasn't some of my more sensitive advice to her. She didn't really appreciate that. Uh, and it, but it took her three years to decide to get the test. And it took her another three years to decide what to do about it once the result came back as positive. Turned out, about the time she decided to go ahead and have something done about it, she discovered a lump in her breast, and she developed, and it turns out that the treatment and the preventive treatment were basically the same thing. So I, so I guess just be, beware of that, uh, that if you decide to pursue some of these things, God may, God may, in his sense, providential sense of humor, have some of these things follow you home. This is why I've decided I'm picking up the prosperity gospel as my next line of research. <laughs> Now, see, we'll see where we can go with, see, yeah. Something tells me that one may not quite follow me home in, the, in, in quite the same way. So, let me, let me suggest, if I could summarize, you sort of where we are in our, in our, in our cultural moment today, as it, as it pertains to the, sac the sacredness of human life, I would summarize it like this, that over the last 40 plus years, since Roe v. Wade has been, has, was, was passed and, and abortion was, became the law of the land, and assisted suicide became allowed in numerous states across the country, and since eugenics is essentially back from its previously discredited Nazi origins in, during World War II, I think if I'd summarize it like this. There has been what I would call an erosion of respect for essential human dignity, culture-wide. And I think throughout a few, you can include the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe. Almost, almost all of the Western world has seen this erosion of respect for essential human dignity. And it's now an open question when we, when we come to this idea of who, who's a member of the human community. It used to be, if you were a human being, you were automatically considered a member of the human community. That's not true any longer. We have all sorts of qualifiers. We now distinguish between a human being and a human person. And it's a person that has the right to life, according to lots of people in our, in our secular culture today. Now, to, still today... 
There are roughly a million abortions done every year. Despite all of our efforts on both sides of the political aisle to make abortion safe, legal, and rare, I think we've gotten the safe, safe and legal part. We failed miserably at the rare part. Uh, and there's no, in my, in my judgment, I could, be, I could be wrong about this, but I think the likelihood, even with the, the current makeup of our Supreme Court, I think the likelihood of Roe, Roe v. Wade being overturned in any of our lifetimes is fairly slim. And I don't actually think it would make a whole lot of difference to the fate of the unborn if Roe v. Wade were overturned. Let me explain what I mean by that. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, what the court, I'm almost positive, would do would be this, exactly the same thing as they did when they ruled on the legality of physician-assisted suicide. What they did in those, in those, there were two cases, one from Washington and one from the state of New York. And the court ruled in both those cases that the state could allow assisted suicide. They could also prohibit it if they so chose. In other words, what the court did in assisted suicide is they tossed the issue back to the states for them to legislate through their legislatures reflecting the will of the people in their particular state. And I'm fairly convinced that that's the same thing the court would do if Roe v. Wade were, were overturned. They would turn it back to individual states. And in my, in my judgment, the, the legal right of abortion has become so entrenched in our culture that my, my own view of this is that most states would move fairly quickly to enact laws that would legalize abortion much in the same way that Roe v. Wade has done. Now, I do think, that that being said, I do think that what the, what the Supreme Court decides does have a really significant educational value. It, it communicates to our culture what, what we ought to believe about certain really important issues of the day. And so I think there will be significant value in, in that decision being overturned in what it would communicate to people. But in my, in my view, the greatest hope for the unborn is technology, not the law. The more, the more we have sophisticated and crystal clear things like 4D ultrasound, which if you've, if you've been pregnant in the last five years or so, you've probably had the option of having a 4D ultrasound. That's like, I mean, that's like getting you up, really up close and personal with an unborn child. And we have a new technique today called DNA phenotyping, which we've borrowed from forensics. If you're familiar with this, some of you may be in law, who in law or if you're in law enforcement, you may be familiar with this, that they, they can take DNA that's left at a crime scene and analyze it, and with the aid of a sketch artist, they can use the DNA that they've come up with at the crime scene and get a reasonable sketch of what the person of interest might look like. And if that's true, if we can do that with an adult, there's also no reason that we can't do that with an unborn child. We can actually project by a, by a DNA profile what the, an unborn child is going to look like in various stages of life. It's this incredible thing that I think is going to give us that the ability to sort of really wrap our arms around exactly what kind of a thing the unborn child actually is. Now, what, what I'm, that being said, there's another trend that really worries me today. And this is something I think to watch out for because pro-choice advocates, I think, are increasingly recognizing that oh, things like ultrasound technology are working against them. They're working against the person who holds that the unborn child is just a clump of cells or the equivalent of a, of a piece of tissue or, as, as one writer put it, no, real, no different than a bag of marbles. So what they have done, increasingly pro-choice advocates are conceding that the unborn child is actually a person and making the argument that the mother has the right to end the life of her full person unborn child. 
Whereas in the past, we thought that once you had shown that the unborn child was a person, that was the end of the discussion. Not so much. The argument is being maintained that it is still justifiable for a woman to end the life of her full person unborn child. We've also seen culturally, and this is another thing that I think is, is, is troublesome about this, we've seen this profound ambivalence in our culture about what exactly an unborn child is. I don't know if you remember, maybe probably eight, ten years ago, on Christmas Eve, a young woman and her eight-month eight month old unborn child who had been ripped from her womb, washed ashore in San Francisco Bay. Lacey Peterson was her name. Her husband, Scott, was charged not with one murder but with two because the unborn child died directly as a result of what he did to kill his wife. And so, and you, you wonder, Lacey could have been on her way to an abortion clinic that day and had virtually the same result, even though she, she would have lived, but the same result for her unborn child, and it would have been perfectly within the law, and nobody would have asked any questions. The difference is that it was assumed that because she was still carrying the child at eight months, that that child was still wanted by her mother or his mother. And the idea here, what, what, what really in our culture today, in the law today, gives an unborn child its right to life is the degree to which he or she is wanted by their mother. Which, of course, is a much greater commentary on the mother than on the unborn child. And it raises some really interesting questions. And this is, you know, in certain, in certain, in, in certain, um, let's just say in certain academic audience, I would probably duck right after I said this. But it raises some fascinating questions about the inequities when it comes to the rights of mothers and fathers related to unborn children. Because under the law today, a woman simply by her choice can choose to sever all responsibility for her child. But the man, simply by his choice, gets him absolutely nothing. In fact, the man, regardless of his choice, is committed to at least 18 years of taking care of that child. Okay? Now, this, hear me correctly. I'm not praising deadbeat dads here. I'm only pointing out the inconsistency with which the law treats the decision that women make as opposed to the decision that men make. I, when I was a doctoral student, we, we had gotten, we become, we become friends with uh, one, of the, one of the doctoral students. See, we were all teaching assistants in, the, in our program. And he had committed the cardinal sin of beginning a, a romantic relationship with one of the students in the class that he was the TA for. He should have been, in my view, should have been booted out of the program for that. But they ended up engaged, and she was pregnant. And it turns she was about probably four, four and a half months pregnant. Really close to viability. And we came into class one Monday morning, and he looked like he'd been run over by a truck. And we said, Robert, what, what's wrong? What happened? And he said, well, over the weekend, my fiance broke our engagement and informed me that she had ended her pregnancy. And you know, I'll never forget what he said. He looked, he looked us right in the eye and said, you pro-life guys were right that she killed my child. And it was, a, it was so powerful how powerless he felt to have anything to do with the child that he had become fully invested in. Right now, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that we ought to you know, we ought to have everything be equal because if I think if, if, men, if, if men carry children, uh, they, it, things might look a lot different than they are today. Amen. I think we'd find out, for one, that men are not nearly as tough as women are. 
among other things. But I think the landscape would look a whole lot different. Uh, now, we do have, the, the other thing that is, I think is really troubling on the cultural landscape, and this is, not, I'm still not quite sure what to do with this, because what this, what's happening with this is that people are, are actually just being consistent with what they believe, and that is that infanticide is on the rise today. And the, and the, and the respectable academic justification for infanticide is really on the rise today. It used to be that the only people who thought infanticide was okay were people who were really way out there on the fringe that very few people took seriously. That's not true today. Infanticide is being considered as a, a legitimate option in lots of the world. And it's, in fact, it's practiced informally in a whole lot of the world. In fact, they estimate that in, in China and India since 1970, 100 million baby girls have been victims of infanticide. A hundred, that's a hundred million baby girls, simply because they are girls. Okay. Now, we have, we have a new euphemism for infanticide, at least in the United States today. We, they're calling it the afterbirth abortion, which if that sounds to you like an oxymoron, you got that right. It, it is. And we have, we have things like the born alive rule that, that says that if a, if a, if a child is, bo is born alive, this may, this may strike you as being utter common sense, which it is. But if a child is born alive, you cannot commit infanticide. Even if the child is born alive because of a botched abortion, you cannot snuff out the life of that child. I can't tell you how many legisla state legislatures across the country, they actually debated the born alive rule. That was up for debate about whether, whether or not it should be legal to, to put a child to death after he or she has been born alive. So I, I think in light of, I mean, there's some very encouraging things on the, on the landscape, but there are also some things I think to be very concerned about and very prayerful about. And we'll, 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 when, we, when we wrap up in a, in a little bit, we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about how to defend the notion that from conception forward, we have a full human person with full rights to life. Now, an extension of this is, has to do with how we view embryos today. Not just unborn children in the womb, but unborn children outside the womb. These are, are unborn children that are created in the lab through what's known as in vitro fertilization. Everybody familiar with what that is? Or the, the pet, Petri dish conceptions? Amen? I, okay, thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I, can't, I'm really, I can't see people nodding their heads. So I'm, I'm working on that. Um, but just, just so you're aware, in the United States, at last count, there are roughly 800,000 embryos, other people's children, in storage in infertility clinics across the country. These are families that had a whole host of eggs harvested, they fertilized a whole host of embryos, and then they implanted two or three and got pregnant with triplets, decided their childbearing days were over, and they have five, eight, ten of their children in embryonic form in storage, and they don't have a clue what to do with them. Because people, it's very interesting, people who have had children through in vitro fertilization have this really strange but not surprising intuitive sense that the embryos are, are not that different from the children that they are holding in their arms. They're just at a different stage of maturity and in a different location. And we are currently sacrificing thousands of embryos on a monthly basis across the Western world 
engaging in embryonic stem cell research to find cures for diseases, when in reality, what we've discovered is that embryonic stem cells are surprisingly resistant to being used for effective treatments. We've, in fact, in uh, ten, 10 years ago, in fact, the, the initiative was just renewed this last election season, uh, where the, the California Regenerative Institute uh, had, had, a, had a $3 billion tax gift from taxpayers to engage in embryonic stem cell research 10 years ago. In that 10-year period, not one treatment has made it to clinical trials. And they just, they just received from the taxpayers another several billion dollar largesse over to last them for another 10 years. Almost all of the clinical, cure, clinical treatments and cures, and there, are, and there are dozens and dozens of them today, are being, are being accomplished using non-embryonic stem cells. Think stem cells from the bone marrow, from your blood, even from the fat cells. It's just amazing to me that the fat cells could have something useful to provide in that way. And then think about it at the other end of life. Okay? There's a whole host of issues around euthanasia and assisted suicide. And this is only going to get more intense in the years to come. And it's, it's basically, it's my generation that's causing this. Because my, my baby boom generation will be, over the next 20 years, will be the largest percentage of people over the age of 65 that this country has ever known. And if all of us get, ev get every bit of health care that we all need, we will bankrupt our health care system. And already in parts of Europe and in parts of the United States, people are connecting legalizing assisted suicide to not bankrupting our health care system. Okay? Never mind the fact that the elderly have the right to life and are made in the image of God in the same way that just the rest of us who are healthy are. But we are increasingly warehousing our elderly and seriously ill people. And it won't be long. In fact, it's already, being, it's already being put out there in Europe. But it won't be long in this country to where we are explicitly saying we have to legalize assisted suicide so that our health care system doesn't get overrun by this huge demographic landslide of people whose health is failing them over the age of 65. Just so you know, statistically, all, all of you will spend roughly half of what you spend on health care in the last 12 months of your life. When it arguably will do you the least amount of good. And we are looking increasingly toward legalizing euthanasia and assisted suicide as part of the solution to make sure that caring for our elderly population doesn't bankrupt our system. Now, assisted suicide is, is legal, I think, in seven or eight states today, probably more to come in the years to come. One of the encouraging notes is there's about 35 of our states that have said no to assisted suicide and to euthanasia. Uh, and I think that's, that's been, a, it's been a good thing. Uh, and I think it's, it's made us much more attentive to how we care for people at the end of life. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have walked with a loved one through the end of life? Okay. That's about the percentage I expect, a pretty high percentage. How many of you have had to make decisions for a loved one about stopping treatments at the end of life? Okay. Right. Pretty good number. How many of you have, who have walked with a loved one through the end of life or made decisions for them felt well prepared? I see I got a half a vote right here, sort of. Okay. That's pretty standard stuff. Uh, and one thing I, I tell my seminary students, I said, you know, you have, you have a golden opportunity to talk about this and to relate the scripture to this to the people who you serve because I know in our churches we talk about resurrection and eternity. I know we talk about it at least one time a year, right? It's, it's coming up 
just to give you a heads up. Okay? But I hope we talk about resurrection and eternity more than once a year. And I think we ought to say something about how our views of, of, of the fact that we're going to spend eternity with Christ, how does that impact how, we, how that affects how we view the end of life and how we walk with people through the end of life? See, the Bible's really clear that we, the, God's original plan for human beings, death and dying was not part of the program, right? Right? The Bible's very clear that death and, death and dying came into the world as a result of the general entrance of sin. And the reason that death and dying is everybody's experience is because sin is everybody's experience. Okay? But the good news that the Scripture teaches is that that's not, the, that's not the end of the story. The good news is that death is a conquered enemy, right? By virtue of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. That's what we're going to celebrate this April. Okay? Now, the, the good news is that, that because death is a conquered enemy, it need not always be resisted. Right? There are times... When, you can, when it's okay to say stop or say enough to medicine. Okay? I, will, I will never forget this. I was, my wife and I were caring for, my, for our early father-in-law, and he had had, he had had surgery for a bladder tumor that was the size of a grapefruit. I'm still not quite, I, did, I didn't think your bladder was as big as a grapefruit itself, but I'm not quite sure how, he got, how it got that way, but he was in his late 80s. And it was a slow-growing tumor, so there wasn't a super amount of urgency. We finally got around to encouraging him to get it operated on. What, what he should have been in the hospital for three or four days stretched into three weeks. He got infections. He got compromised. He had, it, was, it was just awful. Um, and it shouldn't have been a big surprise. And I'll, I will never forget, I'm wheeling him out of the hospital for the last time. And he, his voice was weak, and he could, he could only whisper. And so he motioned, come, come close. And he whispered in my ear. I'll never forget the look on his face. He said, don't ever bring me here again. And I knew, I knew he was deadly serious. What, I think what he, what he meant by that was that I'm done with doctors and hospitals and tests and treatments and tubes and technologies that have put my life into the toilet, figuratively speaking. And he had had enough. And I think he couldn't articulate it quite this way, but I think what he meant was that I will accept as from the hand of God whatever days he has left for me. But I will do it without the invasiveness of tubes and technologies that I don't want. And I think that was okay. I think he, he was accepting the fact that death was a conquered enemy and it need not always be resisted. That under the right conditions, when it's futile or when it's more burdensome than beneficial, a lot of these treatments, I, I spent a lot of years at the bedside consulting with physicians and, and nurses and case managers and we had, some, we had some cases where the nurses, fi they finally just would blurt out, why are we torturing this poor person with treatments? And it was because the family did, didn't understand what they were authorizing their loved ones to do. So I think under the right conditions, I'd, I'd be really careful about this, but under the right conditions, I think it's okay to say stop to medicine. Now let's be clear about this. If I, if I drop to my knees with a heart attack, somebody please call 911. Okay? Don't, don't, don't say, well, he just said death's a conquered enemy and we can let him go. Okay? I don't know why I always feel the need to be really clear about that. All right. Now, here's this, I think this is one thing that will help us because I, I still think a lot of people are they're afraid to die in a hospital. They're afraid, they're afraid of what the dying process is going to be. They're afraid of pain. They're afraid of being out of control. And I think they're afraid of being held hostage 
to the, to the decisions that their, quote, loved ones make for them that may not be the things that they want. And so, again, here, I asked my seminary students this. And this, we, I don't know, I'm, I, maybe we shouldn't necessarily take a show of hands on this, but uh, I asked my seminary students, how many, how many of you have written out what your wishes would be at the end of your life should you not be able to make decisions for yourself? Right? And maybe one in ten has written them out. And usually that person is over the age of 50. Okay? Hardly anybody in their 20s, I've, just, I've discovered that people in their 20s actually basically think they're bulletproof. Uh, and if you, if you remember the name Terry Schiavo, does that name ring a bell with you? She was the one who had who had all this huge national debate over whether a feeding tube should, have been, should be removed. She was 27 when she lapsed into a vegetative state. And if she had written down her wishes, I'm convinced today nobody would ever have heard of her name. And that'd be a really good thing that nobody would have heard of her. Okay. So it's really important, I think, especially if you have elderly parents, uh, or elderly grandparents, uh, because some of you will be in the position of having to make decisions for them. And so you're not flying blind and going in, going in dark. It's really helpful to know what their wishes are at the end of life. And some of the, these are challenging conversations, uh, but I'd encourage you to, to have those as best you can. Now, one other area that is... In, in the area, it comes under the heading of the sanctity of life. And that has to do with the area what we call eugenics, which is Greek for a good birth or good origin, <clears throat> ensuring that a child has the best origin possible. Now, surprisingly, this did not start with the Nazis, even though I made reference to them. They put it on steroids. But it actually started out in the, in the you know, among the, the elites in the United States, in the salons of Europe, uh, Margaret Sanger, who's the founder of Planned Parenthood, was one of the first most ardent advocates of eugenics. And back in the 1920s, when this was first, first uh, put out there, the only way you could really do eugenics was by sterilization. And there were all sorts, I don't know if you know that in 1927, the United States Supreme Court made it legal to involuntarily sterilize the mentally challenged. You aware of that? You aware that one of our Supreme Court justices was quoted, said in his written decision, he wrote, he actually wrote this to be published, said three generations of imbeciles are enough and promoted sterilizing them. We finally overturned that in the late 1940s, but the eugenic urge is back today. And the way it's back is by the technologies that we have available to select not only specific traits for our children, but also we can select the sex of our children with a fairly high degree of reliability. And you can do it without killing a fetus or throwing away an embryo. You can, there's actually a technology today that allows you to separate sperm into the sperm that will give you a boy or a girl. Because, unfortunately, I mean, if Henry VIII had known this, his wives might still be alive at the time. Because <laughs> it's, it's the guy who's responsible for the sex of the child, not the woman. Right? And you can separate those out. If you, if you want to Google when you get home tonight, Google... The, 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 it's the company is called Microsort. I, sometimes I, I get confused. Sometimes I'll say Microsoft, and it's not. <laughs> Microsoft is not in the eugenics business, um, but they have the, these technologies. It will give you an 85 to 90 percent likelihood of selecting the desired sex, and it won't be long before designer children are going to be a reality too, where you can select the, some of the specific traits. For your children. We in the, in the last four years, we have perfected a technology, basically a genetic scissors, 
that allows us to go into sex cells and embryos and snip out defective genes or non-preferred genes and insert, surgically insert the ones that you want to put in. It's called gene editing. And it's, ma it's making eugenics, I think, a, a very live option. I used to tell my students that we will not have designer children in our lifetime. And I was wrong about that. We are on the cusp of being able to design our children. And some philosophers are actually arguing that we are under a moral obligation to genetically engineer our children. Okay. So much for the notion of children being a gift that we receive open-handedly and without specifications. Right? Now, I know what you're thinking, that sometimes we, we put specifications on gifts, like at wedding registries. Okay? The reason we do that is because the, because the bride and groom don't assume that everybody knows what gifts that they want. But guess what? God's not like the bride and groom. God, God knows everything we need. He knows what constitutes a perfect gift for each of us. God doesn't need us to put our specifications on those gifts. Now, the other thing that is really, this is something, I'm still not quite sure what to do with this, but it shows sort of where we are as a culture. Is a few years ago, there was a, le a lesbian couple in England who were both deaf, decided that they wanted to produce, deliberately produce, use technology to produce a non-hearing child. And they engaged the services of a deaf sperm donor in order to basically give them a three in four chance of getting a non-hearing child. And they saw that as fundamentally a good thing. And what's so interesting has been to watch the secular culture wrestle with whether, whether they agree that that's a good thing or not. And the resources in our, in our culture that is so individualist and autonomy driven. It's my own, it's, you know, it's my body, my choice. It's my life, my choice. End of story. That given that view of who we are, it's been so interesting to watch people try and think about and, and, and articulate why that might not be the best choice for that particular child. Okay. So it, it, I think it just it shows the, the, the shallowness of our culture and the way we think about some of these things, which is why I think it's so important that we have a theological base and ultimately go back to timeless principles like the image of God, human beings being made <clears throat> in God's image as the foundation for how we answer some of these questions about who counts as a member of the human community. Now, let, let's... Let me, let, let's think about that question here for just a second. And then we'll, and then we'll, hope, hope we'll have plenty of time, I think, for, for some questions uh, if you want to raise about any of these areas. But here's, let me just make a couple of comments about this. First of all, who, what, who is a person? <clears throat> let me be clear about this. That is not a scientific question. Right? Science can tell us a lot of things about life. I think science can tell us actually when life begins. Life begins when sperm and egg come together to form a new entity, a new genetic entity. Okay? Science is pretty clear about that. What constitutes a human person is a philosophical question and a theolo ultimately, I think, a theological question because if we're not made in God's image, then human dignity is an illusion. If we are, as Richard Dawkins, uh, just part of a world that is committed to blind, pitiless indifference, and we came about simply by chance, simply by a cosmic accident, then there is no good reason for anyone to have essential human dignity. And just so you're aware, government, government thinks that they can grant human dignity. But if, it's, if the history of the 20th century tells us anything, it's that government, what government grants, they can also take away. 
and the, the, history, the, the 20th century was by far the bloodiest century in all of the history of civilization, primarily because of the reign of atheism that denied that there was anything special and significant about human beings. Now here's, I want to, I want to make the case, I mean, we can, we can talk about this biblically too. I mean, obviously because we are made in God's image, God knows us from start to finish. The Bible is very clear that we have a person from conception forward. But to talk to people in our culture who don't care one whit about what the Bible says, our common sense view of a person is that we have an essence that exists through time and change. Think about this. Our whole notion of criminal justice is premised on, on the idea that we are the same person regardless of how much time elapses and how much change we undergo. Right? I can't if I, if I commit a violent crime and I'm on the lam for 10 years or 20 years and I'm finally brought to justice, I can't say to the court, I'm a different person than I was 20 years ago because I've, all my cells have turned over three times and I've lost all my hair and I may have had a lot of plastic surgery or whatever I've had done to me. Right? No, you'd be laughed out of court for that because it doesn't matter how much time elapses or how much change you've gone through, you are still the same person because a person is what you are, not what you are able to do. That's a really important distinction. A person is what you are, not what we can do. So here's the way I'd summarize it. Science can tell us that fetuses and embryos are living human beings. Okay? There, don't let anybody fool you. There is no debate about that. Okay? They, are, they are alive and they are human. Okay? The, the question is whether they are a person or not. And theologically, it's undoubtedly true from Psalm 139 that abortion stops the handiwork of God in the womb. Now, Psalm 139 is so clear that God, God is the one who's created our inmost being. And in the womb, he shepherds and knits us together in, with great intricacy. And between conception and birth, there's really there's no logical place to say, other than conception, to say you have a person. Okay, Because oh, all of them are either changes of location or their, their commentaries on the state of medical technology, not on what kind of a thing a fetus or embryo actually is. So here's, not, not only, this is, this is the punchline, and this is where I, if I'm in certain, certain circles, I really have to duck when I say this. But I think you can make a really good case that not only does the unborn child have the, the right to life. But I think you can also make the case that the unborn child has a claim on the mother's body. Okay? And this, I think, this is particular, I think a particularly helpful thing to recognize, especially when you have, a, when you have you know, a person who will concede to you that the unborn child's actually a person. Okay? And here's, here's the, the argument I would make. Imagine if you have, how many of you have really, any of you have really young children? Okay. How, how, how old is your baby? Three months. Three months. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I'm not sure what you're doing carrying the baby, but I'll, we'll leave that for another time. I'm just kidding. Uh, I understand. And yeah, that's a good thing. But let's say that, um, say in another month, you're at your wit's end. All right. Let's let's say you have a let's say you have a one and a half year old and a and a three year old, just to boot, and you decide I have got to get a break. I've got to get away, okay? And you decide that, you know, I'm I'm going. I'm getting away from all this, and I'm going to Hawaii for three weeks, okay? But you don't decide to leave your children in the care of your very capable family member, okay? Instead, what you do is you stack up three weeks' worth of diapers, 
put them right by the, the, the crib. And you put, you know, three weeks worth of formula or, you know, baby food or whatever you're feeding the baby at the moment. Put that in the fridge. Pat your, pat your three-month-old on the head and say, I'll see you in three weeks. Okay? Now, who would likely greet you on your return? Let's name them. Who are they? The police. All right. Who else? Child Protective Services, no doubt. All right. Who else? Very angry grandparents. Yes. Right. I'd say probably concerned neighbors, maybe the district attorney. Uh, I think there's a chance. Sorry, but this is reality. Probably the coroner might also meet you. Because I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure any any of those children could survive that. Um, now, you would likely be facing charges, right? What charges would you be facing? What? I mean, I'm sure you're a really nice person, so I don't want to <laughs> paint you with a bad brush here. What what charges? Child endangerment. Okay. What else? Uh, child neglect. Okay. Probably not murder, but some sort of maybe manslaughter. Um, maybe, um, I don't know, what's the, what's the term for it? When somebody dies out of your neglect. Invo maybe in, um, voluntary manslaughter, something like that. Negligent homicide, thank you. Uh, okay. Now, why, why would you face those charges? Because you're responsible, right? Okay. Now, what does that tell you about the rights of the child? Wouldn't we say that a really important right of your children has been trampled on? Right? And what is that right? Well, not quite. It's the right to a mother. It's the right to parental care. Isn't that right? We all, we all recognize that. Children have a right to the care that they need to survive and flourish. And if, and if the parents aren't able or are not willing to provide it, Child Protective Services steps in and finds somebody else that will. Okay? Now, if it's true that your child has a claim on you, right? That's what we're saying. has a claim on you for those resources necessary to survive and flourish. Why wouldn't we also say, if we can see that the unborn child is a person that the unborn child has a claim on the mother's body for the resources he or she needs to survive and flourish. I think that's, I think that's where the logic of the, our position takes us, if we're being consistent with that. And I want to be really clear about this, that whether you are a person or not is an all or nothing thing. It's not a matter of degree. Right? You either are a person or not. And if in, increasingly in our culture today, we are seeing that that is we're being, we're just being described as a matter of degree. And if that's true, then we can't have equal rights and a degreed view of a person at the same time. The only way we have equal rights is if everybody is recognized as having the right to life. Amen?